We're engaged in a study of the Bible teaching concerning restoring ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. We have this finished part of looking into the background of that in Europe and what's known as the Protestant Reformation. And those who labored under the Reformation simply were trying to, for the most part, straighten out the corrupt practices of Roman Catholicism. F.G. Allen, a brother who was known back in the 20s and early 20th century, had this to say concerning such things. Luther had broken the fetters with which Rome had for ages manacled the people of God. But instead of bidding the captives go free and return to their native land, he strove only to mitigate their bondage, unquote. Thus, the concept among most of the reformers was not to return to the infallible plan that is the New Testament and simply go back beyond all sorts of religions regardless of the corruption and have a thus saith the Lord for whatever I believed and practiced. John Wesley labored to reform the Church of England, which he considered to be too stifling. And he, by the way, died a member of that particular church. Although what came out of his Reformation activities was the Methodist Church. And he failed to reform the Church of England. Again, I emphasize it seemed to never occur to these people that the Reformation is the wrong approach. They just never seem to think we need to return to the Bible in general, the New Testament in particular, to be just what the Bible says as the Word of God people ought to be. Now those involved in the Great Restoration Movement I say movement because they were trying to lead denominationalism and go back to the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. And that was a great effort, if you read the early 19th century in America, about these things. Because it was very hard to get people to understand that if the Bible is truly the Word of God, why do you need anything else to draw any lines of fellowship? And in those days and times... Denominationalism was very rigid. And while they might not say, well, if you're a Baptist, you're lost, or if you're a Methodist, you're lost, and so on, they would not allow one another to participate in the things that they do. So in that way, at least one way, things have changed a lot nowadays among the denominations. In fact, they have basically lost sight of what made them what they were when they started. But there were people among those churches, Presbyterians and Baptists and others, even Methodists, that were wholly determined to go all the way back to Jerusalem, as it were. Remember how we started our study? That Jesus, and Mary, and Joseph were in Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph left thinking Jesus was with them. They got a ways out of Jerusalem and found out he wasn't. When they returned to Jerusalem, they found Jesus. That's where he always was. And so it is, we need to return to Jerusalem today, the old Jerusalem gospel. And there we will find just what we're looking for if we're seeking to find God and his will. These people who sought to restore Christianity, as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, were fully aware of numerous failures and many efforts to reform. They were a part of it. They were determined to preach the original gospel, and they believed with this Bible we can know what the original gospel is. And they considered any addition to it, any subtraction from it, any substitution, any change at all, be wrong. Now that seems easy for me to say here this day, 
But if you've gone back to 1800 and 1810 and 1820 and along in there, even a little later, that was hard for those people to grasp because they depended so much on the Methodist discipline to make Methodist, Baptist manual to make Baptist, and so on and so forth. Now, they all believed, such as the Methodists, that their discipline was in harmony with the Bible, that the Baptist manual was in harmony with the Bible. But, of course, they recognized that they taught differently. If you're a Methodist, it's because you're disciplined by Methodist doctrine and you abide by it. And that separates you from all denomination, other denominations. So people begin to think a little bit. We have one Bible. That's God's Word. All denominations say that. We talk about the same Father and the same Son and the same Holy Spirit. We talk about Christians. Why are we all split up? Well, I wish people would think that way today, but that's not the way people think today because they're very, very much not for authority today. But they looked in those days at proper authority. They knew they had to have proper authority to be what God wanted them to be. Now, let's remind ourselves that Christianity is the religion of Bible authority. And if people do not respect Bible authority and understand how to ascertain that authority, they'll never know what it is to be a Christian as you read over the New Testament. So these people started out basically saying, well, we must have the right standard of authority. And they all finally were beginning to come together in the first 20 to 30 years of the 19th century here in America and determined that we don't need anything but the Bible. A lot they didn't know at that time, but they were determining that. And they wanted to reconstruct. They were determined to reconstruct the churches that appeared on the pages of the New Testament as it was in the first century in apostolic days. They very meticulously and very carefully and prayerfully engaged in what we can call the great search for the ancient order of things. And in this respect, they were working upon a new principle, and that is the principle of restoration. Now, it is true, and I mentioned that earlier, that Ulrich Zwingli in Europe had recognized the importance of this vital principle among all of those Reformationists at that time. But I said at the time I first mentioned him that I don't know how much impact he would have had because he died rather early in his time of declaring we ought to do only what the New Testament authorizes. Now, according to Dabnew's history of the Reformation, here's what he said, quote, Luther was desirous of retaining in the church all that was not expressly contradicted by Scripture, while Zwingli was intent on abolishing all that could not be proved by Scripture. The German reformer wished to remain united to the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, and sought only to purify it from everything that was repugnant to the Word of God. The reformer of Zurich passed back over every intervening age till he reached the time of the apostles and subjecting the church to an entire transformation, labored to restore it to its primitive condition, unquote. Now, when you go back and study those days, you'll find that Zwingli's work was overshadowed by that of Luther. It remained for those who sought to restore the church to properly emphasize the vital principle that Zwingli learned about. Next of all, the great men who labored for the restoration recognized that restoration was both desirable and possible. That restoration was, let's look at this word first, desirable was, and we can say, and is, clearly seen when you consider the totality of the Scripture teaching related to it. The complete Bible story shows that God's plan for man's redemption was and is 
essential. It's not something optional. It's not something to be taken lightly or to be disregarded. God would not have involved himself and, of course, others in the tremendous amount of time and the multitudinous details as well as circumstances that is inherent in the scheme of redemption if that plan were not essential. And I say that in view of what we said on Sunday morning as you start in the first of the Bible and it comes down to where in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son that all things Jesus did and the church being established, etc., getting the New Testament here on earth, that involved, a, as I said, a multitudinous amount of details. And one must spend time studying the Scriptures just to see it. But we can see that that's how important that is to God. And what's important to God, especially relates to your salvation and mine, ought to be important to each one of us. Further, the New Testament clearly shows that God's condemnation abides upon those who go beyond, who fall short of, who disregard, alter, or make substitutions concerning God's plan revealed in His sacred word. Man is not to tamper with it. Never can you find anywhere from Genesis to Revelation that God says, it's all right to change my word when you get ready. If it doesn't suit you, just alter it. Warning after warning is given to the contrary. You know well in your own study that the Bible often warns of false teachers and false teachings. And when we finished not long ago, as we went through 2 John, is whosoever transgresseth, the American Standard 1981 says, goeth onward. And abideth not in the doctrine or teaching of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine or teaching, the same hath both the Father and the Son. 2 John 9. Now if I have the Father and the Son through adherence, proper adherence to the Word of God, then I don't want to mess with it. Then when you look at Galatians 1, as the New Testament's being written and Paul writes to the churches of Galatia, he has learned that some pretty soon after their conversion were beginning to leave the pattern of sound words, the gospel. And he made it clear, I marvel. I marvel that you're so quickly removing, as the American standard says, you're in the process of doing it, from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto a different gospel, different from what I preached unto you. And the one I preached to you is the one. That's what it comes down to. And he says, which is not another gospel, a gospel of a different kind from what I preached unto you. Only there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse or anathema, cut off from God. And that's what God thinks of false teachers. And then he repeated himself. And any time inspiration repeats itself, you better set up and take notice because God's not obligated to say anything but one time before it's binding on us. As we said before, Paul writes, So sigh now again. If any man preacheth unto you any gospel other than that which you've received, let him be accursed or anathema. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. In the American Standard Version, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first epistle, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. Now listen to him. That in us ye might learn not to go beyond the things which are written. But that's not all. You close out inspiration. The last book of the Bible. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them, God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Again, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. 
Now, if we don't know any other scriptures, we believe these scriptures are from God to guide you and me as to our attitude and approach to the study of the Bible, to the study of the Word of God. Surely we see that we should be fearful in how we handle the Bible. So I think it clear, therefore, that God intended for the original gospel to be the gospel for every century till the end of time. Notice, Jude 3. Beloved, while I was giving all diligence to write unto you of our common salvation, I was constrained to write unto you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints, ASV 1901. Once for all there means once for all time. People come along claiming Latter-day Revelations. They're condemned by this verse if no other. Certainly Galatians 1, 6 through 9 would also. It is complete just as it is. It's our efforts in the study of the Bible to leave it alone in the sense we don't change anything. Thus, the challenge to every one of us is to accept this book for what God meant it to be and is the Word of the Living God. Now, that complete revelation was and is possible. I'll underscore that word possible. It's seen in consideration of some things that I want to note with you now. First of all, the fact that the faith, that's the system of salvation in the word of the truth of the gospel of the New Testament. The New Testament system, the divine plan, was given once for all. That within itself implies that restoration, restoration is possible. The fact that it's sin to go beyond that which is written means that restoration is possible. The fact that the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11, means that restoration is possible. Now, if you go back to the early days in the 19th century here in America, you'll see that those who set their course to do what we've been talking about here, the restorers, we shall call them, emphatically declared the same seed, the Word of God, the seed of the kingdom, sown in the same soil, the minds of men, people taught the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth regarding salvation, will produce the same type of harvest. Christians, such as Paul and Timothy, and as that word is used and defined in the New Testament, not some sort of hyphenated Christian. Now, already, just stopping here, you can see how far that is away from the denominational system that says one is saved by Christ, and you pick a church that suits you, and you go with it. That's so foreign to what the New Testament teaches concerning the Lord's church and salvation and how God brings it about through Christ and the gospel. God forbids the sowing of any other kind of seed. And why should anybody want to sow any other kind of seed or teach any other doctrine? I don't understand that, but why should they? I think a lot of times people just haven't understood. They haven't thought about it. They just do what they've always done. Mom and Daddy did it. Grandpa and Grandma did it. Whoever else I've been with, always done it. And we in the Lord's church must be careful as we begin to operate the same way. The New Testament must ever be fresh and new to us from the standpoint it's God's will and we can't change it. And we must marvel at it. We must stand amazed at it because it is God's will and it always will accomplish what God intended it to when it's taught to people with honest and good hearts, Luke 8, 15. So to produce something else other than the kingdom of heaven, then another kind of seed must be sown. But God forbids the sowing of any other kind of seed. That restoration is possible is further seen in consideration of the Bible teaching with regard to type and antitype. Now in the Old Testament, we have the type. 
in the New Testament, we have the anti-type. For example, Noah's salvation by water. The Old Testament tabernacle, which I hope in class on Sunday morning we'll get to that and spend some time on that. The Canaan rest for the children of Israel. The wilderness journey. The Passover feast. The table of showbread. These and multitudes of other matters are presented to us in the Old Testament in type or copy or shadow or figure. In the New Testament, in the Christ, His gospel, His church, His blessings, we have the antitype, we have the original, we have the substance, we have that which is real. So when I read the Old Testament, specifically the law of Moses, I'm seeing it always point in shadow and type to the New Testament. Thus, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And like Noah and like Moses, we must build according to the pattern. Thus, you can see, as was pointed out and emphasized by Eric recently, that we, as Paul admonished Timothy, must hold fast the pattern of sound words, the pattern of wholesome teaching or doctrine. That these folks in the early part of the 19th century in America determined to do. And you can see how determined they were if you go back and study some of that because they gave up friends and family and churches that had long been a part of their life because they could not find what people taught in them. Next of all, the restorers deeply realized that division among those who believed in God and Christ and the Bible was wrong. And you'll find that they reflected prayerfully and carefully upon the Lord's prayer for unity. That's recorded in John chapter 17. First of all, verse 11, and then you can see it emphasized in verses 20 through 23. Jesus praying on the night before he was to be crucified the next day. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Then he goes ahead down later and says, Neither for these only do I pray. That is, he's been praying for the apostles. But for them also that believe on me through their word. And I is praying for you and me. That they may all be one even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that thou didst send me. Let me pause here and say, I don't know of a greater hindrance to the cause of Christ than denominationalism, division. Because Jesus said they ought to be one, that's in mind and word and action. So the world would believe that thou sent me. I also know that they preached the very significance of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. Some division has showed up in the church at Corinth and Paul didn't tolerate it. He said, now I beseech you, I beseech you, I'm on bending knee imploring you. Now I beseech you, brethren. And notice, through the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the authority of your Savior and the head of the church, he who has all authority in heaven and on earth, that you all speak the same thing, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. These, of course, were things of obligation. One must believe and obey to be saved from sin, become a Christian, and to be faithful to the Lord in his church. I have concluded after many years with a number of people, they just don't believe this passage. I've had occasion, and others have too, from time to time, just to read this passage and say, do you really think denominationalism fits 1 Corinthians 1.10? You understand the word. You acknowledge that to be the word of God. It'll judge you on the last day. 
How can you allow for such a thing? And it covers any division in the Lord's church. Now, he's not talking about where people are wrong and they don't want to change and you're doing all you know to do to change them and they're going to pursue an evil way and then you just have to leave them. Because Paul taught there is a division that's authorized. Come ye out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. The unclean thing is that which is not authorized. So there is a division that is contrary to God's will. There's a division that's right. There's a unity that is right, a oneness, and there's a oneness that's wrong. We should not try to stay unified with those who believe all sorts of sizes of doctrines that contradict one another and say, well, we're all right. We just won't bring up our differences. Now, you find that in the New Testament. In fact, the verses we've read would destroy that idea. These brethren back in the first part of the 19th century, seeking to be what we all read of in the New Testament that the first century Christians were, they believed and they preached God's, so we make a play on words, wonderful plan as it's set forth in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul said to the church in Ephesus, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I'm on bending knee begging you, that you walk worthy of the calling, where with your call, we're called by the gospel of Christ. And then he said, with all lowliness and meekness, proper disposition of mind toward properly constituted authority and the will of heaven to be in submission to it, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, giving diligence. You have to work at it. Have you ever noticed how things really worthwhile and abiding take a lot of effort? A lot of stick to itness, steadfastness, stay with it, work at it, giving all diligence to keep the unity of the Spirit, the Spirit, the unity of the Spirit's revealed, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he gives us God's platform for unity and names the planks in that platform. There's one body and one Spirit even as you're called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all or above all and through all and in all. There's God's platform for unity. Now, why should I want to change that? It's in the inspired word of God. It'll read and mean the same way on the day of judgment as it reads and means now. But now's the time we can change to embrace it and be what those people were by following this wholesome doctrine. Next of all, the restorers recognized and respected the Christ as being the head and the only head of the church he built, the church he purchased with his own precious blood, Acts 20 and 28. They recognized and they firmly preached that the church that you read of on the pages of the New Testament is the Lord's spiritual body, Colossians 1.18. That there is but one body, Ephesians 4, verse 4, which I've just read, and that Christ is the one head of that one body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. I fear greatly that over the past many, many years, even in my lifetime now, I've preached since I tried to preach, I called it my first sermon in March of 1965. <laughs> I don't know what they called it, but I called it my first sermon. And all these years I preached, I've seen, been among a lot of preachers and a lot of members. And I've seen this idea basically shunned, just don't make people feel like they're lost if they're in a denomination. I remember one place where I preached at a business meeting. One man plainly spoke at the meeting, says, why have we got to hear so much preaching on denominationalism? If you're a Christian, to have a disposition of mind that allows you to come to that kind of thought tells me you have already begun to fall and fall a long way. This meant, and it means now, that the New Testament church does not have an earthly head that needs to be pointed out that's the case. Christ is ruling over the church, sitting at the right hand of God, having all authority, and he manifests his will to mankind in his last will and testament. You cannot know what Christ wants you to do to be saved or to be faithful in his church if you don't read and understand the New Testament. 
In the fifth place, and I think that's where we are, I'll just put it this way, the next place, the restorers stressed of the Bible, the Word of God is our only authoritative guide in religious matters. And you say, well, all members of the church is the Bible defines the church. You must believe that. They don't either. Some don't know they don't believe it, but you hit one of their pet doctrines or hit one of their own people, you'll find out very quickly they'll do this. Well, I knew old brother so-and-so, and he didn't believe that, and he's a fine man. Well, old brother so-and-so is going to be in line with everybody else, giving account of the deeds done in the body to Christ, whether good or bad, in the light of the infallible truth that won't change and teaches now what it will teach then and mean then what it means now. But we'll do that. We'll go right back to what we say people all around us shouldn't do, and we'll do it. We're disposed to be that way, but that disposition of mind may cause a whole host of folks to be lost. Well, I never heard of that. Well, so you are now. <laughs> well, well, I don't know whether the Bible teaches that or not. Do you think you can learn? <laughs> people amaze me. But in the church, they'll fall right back to the same thing denominational people have been doing a long time and trying to justify them in things they cannot prove from the Bible. But we should be careful about that. Very careful. So they believe, therefore, that it was addressed by God to the minds of men. When you pick up your Bible and read it, do you think of it that way? Here is something from God, especially given, addressed to me. It's designed to lead me from earth to heaven. There's nothing else that can. These people were having thoughts about that early 19th century in America. Doesn't mean other people before that didn't, but I'm speaking now of what happened in this nation. They believed and they preached, therefore, at least so far as concerns human duties and responsibilities, it can be and it must be understood. That is the Bible. This is the reason I stand amazed at people saying, oh, that's just your interpretation. Or that's just the way you were raised. Well, that's just what you've been exposed to. As if the only thing I can be is the way I was raised. There's no personal conviction based upon my own study of the Word of God addressed to me. I'm just, having, I'm just hung up in whatever environment I'm in. Well, I happen to be one who doesn't believe that you are the product of your environment. I believe you can go against your environment. I believe these men of the 19th century in America did do that because the environment they were in was denominationalism and all of what it taught. But they went against it. Why? Because they could read the Bible for themselves. They could understand it. They believed and they preached that the Bible was the and is the inspired word of the living God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that it came forth from God and that God infallibly put it on this earth even though he used fallible men to write it down. They didn't mean by inspiration then what the modernists and the liberals mean by inspiration, that you're inspired like Shakespeare or Milton or somebody like that, some great author. They mean exactly, and they meant exactly, and we do today what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13. And to sum that up, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 13, God revealed by the Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, the things, Paul says as apostles, unto us, which thing we speak. We speak what he revealed to us by the Spirit. Not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, that is, we didn't choose the words and plug it into the thought. The very words of the original Greek of the New Testament was given by God. But which the Spirit teacheth. The American standard says combining spiritual things, the things that are revealed with spiritual words. That again just says do not tamper with the word of God. They therefore proclaimed that the word of God was infallible, inerrant, all sufficient in matters pertaining to life and godliness as set forth in passages we referred to many times already, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 2 Peter 1, 3, Acts 20 and verse 32, and so many others. They preach that human beings are obligated, it's our duty in other words, 
to love the Word of God, to live the Word of God, to study the Word of God, to learn it, to believe it, to obey it, to defend it, and to teach it to others without subtraction, alteration of any kind, compromise in any way, but simply as it is truly the Word of God. They emphatically declared that there was no reason for and no need for human creeds and confessions. I was blessed in God's good providence to be raised in a church that had preachers that preached like I'm talking about now. But as I grew up and got among people further away from where I grew up at home and so forth, I realized a lot of folks a good while before that, and especially in the intervening years to this point in my life, that people were hearing a whole lot of feel-goodisms. They were not emphasizing the oneness of the Lord's church. And they were sort of acting rather loosely with any doctoral principle and saying, you can't be dogmatic or you're too narrow or you're a legalist or whatever, trying to get away from simply what the Bible says. And I know that today in the mood or the mindset of America, it's not too appealing to people today because it, it, it gets pretty strict with the way people think and speak and live and people don't want to have that. So it makes it more difficult to reach people with the truth because they don't want to be bound by the truth. Think about this for a moment. Truth is very narrow. Very narrow. Let me go back to what I've done with you many times. This is a microphone. Now, I don't care what you might do with it otherwise, but I can define microphone, and you can too, and that's what it is. Yeah, but I want it to be a banana. Well, you may want it to be a banana all you want to. It is a microphone. Well, you're awful dogmatic. I think it's a banana. You think all you want to think about it, it is a microphone. Boy, Brother Brown sure was mean in preaching that way. So unloving. He just determined to make that thing a microphone because that suits him. I think it's a banana. You see how it works? That's a microphone. Truth corresponds with reality. That's how you know it's the truth. When you say in a courtroom, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you're saying... I'm going to declare reality. Now, this is a microphone, whether you're old or young, male or female, rich or poor, sick or healthy. That's what you call objective truth. It doesn't change. And you're thinking about it to be something else won't change that. It's a microphone. These people of the early 19th century and throughout this nation, there was a lot more of that attitude about truth so it caught fire. And a multiplicity of people by 1840 had said, well, that's not a banana, it's a microphone. <laughs> because they realized the reality of the Bible being the word of God, given from God to man infallibly, meant to guide man, and nothing else was given in its place. And it was not to be tampered with. So the first thing restored by them was the only rule of faith and practice and religion is the Bible. That took a great deal of effort on their part to jar themselves loose for all those human creeds and stuff that had governed the churches for hundreds of years. Even denominationalism by the time of the early 19th century had been around for a long time. So we need to understand that in matters of religion, we must have authority to be acceptable to God of the Word of God. So they devoted, that is the restorers did, much time and prayerful study to the question of how does God authorize. We were going up to, going and coming, up to Huntsville last a week ago Saturday. Some of you probably noticed this, but on the side of the road, some church meeting in the barn of some sort or the other had a big sign out front, Jesus Party. You may see that. I told Jody went by, I said, if you were to go over there and walk up to those people and say, where in the New Testament is a Jesus party authorized? They wouldn't wonder where you're talking about. The sad part about it is, I'm afraid, same way through many members of the church. And that's the reason they apostatize. They leave the faith. That's the reason the New Testament is so clear about hold on to it. 
be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Well, you can't do that if you don't hold on to the truth. How are you going to know what the work of the Lord is if you don't hold on to the truth? But I'm going to close today because I've got a lot more to say on this. I can't say it all today, Nancy. A whole lot more needs to be said. It should have been said over all these years. But I want us to realize there'll never be a time when what we're teaching here should not be taught and taught regularly. Privately, in classes, from this pulpit, everything else. The only thing that keeps the church of, by, and for Jesus Christ of the glory of God the Father and the salvation of men is our adherence, close adherence, dogmatic adherence to truth, gospel truth, and we won't be moved off of it. There may be fewer people in the building or even in making up the church as a whole throughout the nation of the world. But how many people were on the ark? And how many people... 20 years old and upward that left Egypt entered into the land of Canaan. And you have to ask yourself the question, why did those people that died in the flood die in the flood? And why did those people who died by the thousands wandering in the wilderness, why did they die in the wilderness? And since the Old Testament is a system of shadows and types, what does that tell us in plain language from the New Testament? It tells us we need to be so very careful about what we believe, the source of our belief, and how we carry it, our, carry it out in our lives. So we want to be mindful of the fact that if you are going to be what the New Testament says Paul was as a Christian, you're going to have to understand and appreciate and have respect for the Word of God and the authority of God manifest in those words as we study it and write and divide it. And be determined then to abide by it at all costs. Well, we'll stop here, and if we don't have, if we have someone here who's not a Christian, then we urge you to obey the gospel and become a Christian. You don't have to have everybody else doing it. Just know you're supposed to do it. The Bible was given to direct you and me. Read it and know that God speaks to you personally this way, and you can know whether you believe the truth. Or you don't, and if you don't, embrace the truth and give up the error. That's one reason the restoration of New Testament Christianity caught hold so well in the early part of the 19th century. is because people concluded, I don't need some preacher or some synod or some conference or some discipline or some manual to tell me what's right or wrong. I have my Bible. And you know, most of those pioneer People in those days had a Bible if they had any book. And they believed it to be the Word of God. And that caught hold and caused people to see we need to be Christians. Christians only. And be in fellowship with God the way Paul was. If you need to obey the gospel, you need to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've wandered from the authority of your Savior, in any way, we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Please take advantage of that now if you need, while we stand and while we sing.